The purpose, uh, again, in a simple definition of everything is to grow in consciousness. So we start with limited awareness as, ch as a child and then grow to expand our awareness. We gain knowledge. That's one, one way of doing it. But we gain also understanding of who we are, where are we in this universe, what are the others, who they are, why they are there, what's my relation to them, what's my relation to the environment. And as you expand your understanding of that, you are expanding your ability to be happy, to have even more choice and more possibilities. And so the expansion of consciousness is the purpose of life until it reaches its full value of supreme consciousness. And with the expansion of consciousness, there is actually an expansion of happiness. So mm -hmm. we can also say the expansion of happiness is the purpose of life. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and blessings, everyone, and welcome to Take Back Your Mind. I am your host, Michael B. Beckwith, founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center, and it is always my joy week after week to bring you into this magnificent podcast where I have the opportunity to have wonderful conversations with individuals who are exploring the deeper nature of consciousness, how to take back their own mind from being hijacked from the world of effect, the world of appearances and experiences, and to basically open ourselves up to the discovery and the activation of our infinite potential and how we can move through this world emanating sense of peace and of love that's basically intrinsic to us. And so today, I have the privilege of having Dr. Tony Nader with me today. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Globally recognized expert in the science of consciousness and human development. Dr. Nader, who received his MD from Harvard, PhD from MIT, is trained in internal medicine, psychiatry, and neurology. He's a best selling author whose newest New York Times best selling book, Consciousness is All There Is, was recently released. Tony's interest in exploring full potential of human physiology and the human mind led him to study and conduct research on ancient and modern techniques of self-development. His research has been published in several journals, including Neurology, the Journal of Gerontology, I studied that at USC, and Progress in Human Research. For many years, Tony worked closely with Maharis Mahesh Yogi, who introduced Transcendental Meditation to the World in 1958. I got my mantra in 1970, I don't know, three, two, three, something like that, and who emphasized the scientific understanding and validation of Transcendental Meditation. Tony is currently the head of Global Transcendental Meditation Organization. That's beautiful. He's been featured in Wired Magazine, the BBC, Gaia Network, How To Academy, and on many of the world's most prominent shows and magazines discussing our full potential and answering the deepest questions about life and living. Dr. Tony Nader, welcome to Take Back Your Mind. Thank you, wonderful, uh, Reverend. Beautiful to be with you. Give us a little bit of your backstory as to how you ultimately, you know, became so interested in the understanding of consciousness. I mean, what, what were some of the key um, touchstones in your life that led you to open up to this vast understanding and teaching of, of this? I grew up in a tradition of medical doctors in the family and wanted to become a medical doctor almost naturally. But my interest was to understand how people make decisions, uh, why we are who we are. So I sought studying psychiatry after completing my medicine uh, and my internal medicine would be helpful. Um, what happened is uh, I found that it was not really fulfilling my full uh, 
potential in terms of what I expected from life and, and from all the aspects of reality, understanding how the body works, how the mind works, etc. And so I went into the study of meditation and mental practices uh, from the ancient traditions of of knowledge uh, and meditation, such as transcendental meditation. And I found great fulfillment in it, but I kept doing research on the brain and neuroscience and trying to answer the big questions about life and living and meaning of life. So it took me from understanding individual uh, reality as a physiological entity to mind and decision making and behavior and social behavior, particularly that um, I grew up in an area in Lebanon where there was a civil war and now it's kind of coming back. I know, I know. I'm, I'm, we're praying as a community, we're praying for peace there in yes. the, the whole section. Yeah, the yeah. East really needs it. And yeah. so um, I had these big questions about why people kill each other, why people on the basis of what's supposed to be unifying, what's supposed to be holistic, which is spirituality and religion, yet because they take one angle or the other uh, and they understand reality from different perspectives and you add to this all kinds of economic factors, etc. Um, and people start, you know, instead of working together, start destroying uh, each other. And so... That led me to the big questions, and I thought, uh, what can I do to answer them? And I had the luck or chance to be with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, mm. who had brought this knowledge from the ancient wisdom of the East. Uh, and I practically, personally experienced directly this inner peace and harmony through transcendental meditation. And then ask questions about how we live our life, what is the meaning of life, where we live it, and realize we live it actually in consciousness, in awareness. Because without consciousness, we don't feel love, we don't feel happiness, we don't feel anything. If you are in deep anesthesia, you know, nothing means anything. You might be the wealthiest person in the universe or the most loved person. What does it matter to you? So what is that consciousness? That was my main uh, study and interest. And that's how I got into this field. You talked about studying the meaning of life. And so the proverbial question that people always seem to ask is, what is the purpose of life? And how can our consciousness unlock, you know, uh, that purpose? How, how would you answer that question? It's a long, of course, uh, discussion. I know, I know it is. You can, you, you can give me a cliff note version. <laughs> <laughs> the PhDs and doctorate trying to ask and lifetime of research. But basically, let's ask what is life really? What is meaningfulness of life? Because what is the purpose of life? Assumes that we know what life is about in a sense. And life for us humans, but an extension in my paradigm that I present, the theory I present, uh, life and living and everything actually is consciousness. Yes. Um, because again, without consciousness, we life has no meaning. There is no meaning. So uh, where do we find meaning? We find meaning in our mind, in our awareness, in our intellect. And all of these are aspects of our consciousness. So to be conscious, to be awake, to be able to analyze life and understand it uh, is where the meaning of life must be. So consciousness is then primary to understanding anything, to living anything. And so from extension from that, uh, what is the maximum life would be in that sense for just to make a long story short, the maximum ability of life is maximum consciousness, mm -hmm. which means being aware of maximum amount of reality. What is reality? What is my presence in the universe, where am I going, what is the purpose of it all. And again, reflecting back on that, uh, the purpose, uh, again, in a simple definition of everything is to grow in consciousness. So we start with limited awareness as, ch as a child, and then 
grow to expand our awareness. We gain knowledge. That's one, one way of doing it. But we gain also understanding of who we are, where are we in this universe, what are the others, who they are, why they are there, what's my relation to them, what's my relation to the environment. And as you expand your understanding of that, you are expanding your ability to be happy, to have even more choice and more possibilities. And so the expansion of consciousness is the purpose of life until it reaches its full value of supreme consciousness. And with the expansion of consciousness, there is actually an expansion of happiness. So mm -hmm. we can also say the expansion of happiness is the purpose of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in, in, so in defining consciousness itself, it, it appears as though what you're saying, consciousness itself, is, is basically our awareness. And our, our awareness that we are, we are awareness itself. And exactly. so to the, to the degree that we have insight into that, then limited consciousness means that we're basically focused maybe on conditions or circumstances. But when our consciousness expands, we become more aware of the, the beauty, the intelligence, the love that is here. And you use, you use the word choice as well. Yes. So with the expansion of our awareness, our choiceability increases. Yes. We're able to choose right. rather than react. Right. Right. Yeah. The, you know, the more you know, the more you can choose. Because if I tell you, you have a situation and you have to choose between three things because this is all you can see in front of you, mm -hmm. then your choice is only one, two, or three. But if your awareness is wider and you can see 10 things, then you can choose between one, two, three, up to 10. And if your awareness is much broader and you see a larger number of possibilities, then uh, automatically your ability to choose is bigger. Right. So the bigger the awareness, the larger the ability to choose. You know, if you corner a cat in a uh, in a corner, of course, there has only two or three choices. Either it jumps at you or it runs away. And if you corner a human being in a situation, they're going to try to talk to you. They're trying to think of alternatives and all that because their awareness of possibilities is broader and therefore their ability of choice is greater. So truly freedom and ability to choose expands with consciousness. Yes, yes. So basically, if a person's consciousness or awareness is limited, then they actually experience that limitation based on their perception. Limitation is not built into the universe. It's built into our own perception. Beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. I'd like to make a short comment on the difference between awareness and consciousness. Okay. Um, and so I define consciousness as a holistic aspect for an individual, like my individual consciousness is my ability to be aware of different things. But this includes uh, all these different things. For example, um, you have one has within oneself the ability to drive a car maybe to play a musical instrument, maybe to be a teacher, maybe to be a parent or a child or a friend or a teacher or a doctor. or All of these, maybe one builds up in one's life and experience. And when one is dealing with a specific situation, for example, let's say a doctor dealing with a patient, then the doctor's awareness is a, a doctor's awareness. Mm -hmm. And so the, I'm aware of my situation as a doctor. I'm not thinking about me as a father or a mother or a child of somebody. Um, when I'm dealing with my children, then I feel I am now a mother or I am a father or whatever. When I'm driving a car, I am aware of the road, I'm aware of driving and all of that. So awareness shifts from one situation to the other to the other. Right. If you put all of these potential awarenesses, if you like, that is in one individual, then you are defining their scope of consciousness, their ability to be conscious. So consciousness is more fundamental <clears throat> than being aware of one thing or the other or the other. 
So our consciousness is who we are overall. Our awareness is what we put our attention on. I like that. Points in our history, in our yeah. life. So who we are as a spiritual being, we are pure consciousness. Right. Then our, our awareness is based on what we are focusing on and we are aware upon at any particular moment. Beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Now I, I see here um, you have a background in neuroscience and transcendental meditation. These, how do these two fields converge in explaining the, the nature of the universe and human existence? I mean, at some point, science and spirituality have kind of come back together after all of these years, whereas before they were kind of divorced in the Middle Ages. But uh, you're, you're a neuroscientist, and you, you, you are the president of the uh, Transcendental Meditation Society. So how, do that, how does that converge? It's really, as you said, uh, that there is a continuity. It's not that there are two realities, as you said, in the Middle Ages or even later. Descartes defined that there are two entities. One is physical and one is non-physical, non-material. And this is our soul with our spirit. And then our body is something different. And now we know, even from a scientific perspective, that it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. What happens in the mind is reflected as chemical, biochemical, electrical changes in our nervous system. And whatever happens in our nervous system, to whatever extent we have access to it in our mind, changes our mind. You know, you can eat the wrong food and feel uh, happy or feel not good. Uh, or you can, you know, have hallucinations. Uh, uh, you can do an activity physically and that it changes your chemistry of the brain and that leads to a different experience on a mental level. So mind and body are intimately connected and actually not just intimately connected as two entities, but a continuum of one reality mm. appearing in different layers of its surface value. Now the question becomes, what is that reality ultimately? Is it physical matter that then appears as mental processes? Or is it actually consciousness that appears as physical and mental processes? And there are different philosophers and thinkers that have different opinion about that. What I present in my book uh, is a very, very uh, radical paradigm, if you like, that, that actually consciousness is the all there is. Yes. So that is the title of the book, which actually takes the paradigm and the theory that actually consciousness is primary and even the universe itself is a manifestation of consciousness. So there is a continuity, but the basic value is more abstract consciousness that within its dynamics creates the experiences that we see as physical reality. Absolutely. That's what we teach here. Base consciously precedes form. Consciousness precedes everything. Beautiful. And so therefore, uh, scientists used to teach that consciousness emerged from form or something like that, or the brain produces consciousness. But we know now that consciousness, as, you, as your book says, consciousness is everything. And it precedes all manifestation. So the... Um, the ramifications of that bring forth a greater clarity around healing, a greater clarity around transcending past experiences in our life and things of that particular nature. Because if we can come back to the root of our consciousness, uh, which is unsullied, which is pure, then the manifestation of that will show up, as you say, mentally, show up chemically in our body, it'll show up uh, with more expanded choices. The ramifications are amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Let's just talk about free will for a moment. I mean, uh, is there such a thing as free will or is this, are we experiencing something that's predetermined based on something that's been set in motion or a combination of both? How would you, how would you move into that dynamic of free will? Um, and, and my development of the idea of free will uh, based on this consciousness is all there is paradigm 
free will is a necessity actually free freedom is a necessity for manifestation because when we <laughs> ask the big question why does manifestation happen so that takes us to some very profound questions in philosophy and meaning of life and spirituality we have to find the reason why this ocean of consciousness <clears throat> appears as many so in order to understand that, we have to uh, have a concept of what is ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. And the way <clears throat> I present this in the book, but of course, it's not just my idea. It's an idea from uh, ancient wisdom and all time that there is an ocean of consciousness. That's how Maharishi Mahesh Yogi presented, for example. And that ocean is not material, not physical. And it's a field of consciousness, <clears throat> which means it is itself conscious. Its nature is to be conscious. That's why we're calling it consciousness. So that field is like an ocean without any materiality, any physicality in it, that is unbounded and that reflects on itself. Mm -hmm. and it's conscious of itself in an infinite number of ways. So the question was how to... Uh, how to represent or how to uh, explain and the reason why to justify why actually there is the limited perspective. If there is one ocean and it's a field of all consciousness and it reflects on itself, why are there these limited perspectives that we have as humans? Some of us have so much limited perspective, others bigger perspective, broader understanding. Animals have lesser consciousness. Mm -hmm. Trees have lesser experience and interaction with objects and with the sun or with the field and the nutrients. So they are much more limited in their awareness. So there is there are two things, therefore, in consciousness. There is the absolute consciousness, which is a field of unlimited, pure existence. And there is relative consciousness, which is a field of specific values of consciousness that are manifest in the universe. So the question becomes, why this field of unbounded consciousness, the absolute pure being, which has everything, why would it manifest as specific values? And the reason that I offer in the book is that its nature is to be conscious and therefore to be conscious in all possible ways. One way to be conscious is to be unbounded consciousness, but there are an infinite number of ways to be conscious in a limited perspective. So it be conscious like this person, be conscious like that other person, be conscious like a cat, be conscious like a dog, be conscious like this and that. And therefore this limited consciousness which makes the reality very narrow in perspective has to forget that it is ultimately pure consciousness mm -hmm. as one requirement and the other requirement it has to be able to think and feel and act from its own perspective this is where freedom comes. Mm -hmm. Freedom comes from the necessity to have the experience of limited perspective. So at the basis of manifestation, freedom is a necessity. Of course, I'm trying to put in few words because we have limited time. Yeah, but this, it, you're doing very well. This is very good. Thank you. So it's explained in great detail in the book and why and the logic for it and how it makes sense. So there is that freedom of choice, which has limited values on the lower levels of manifestation. So you take an atom, it doesn't have really choice. It has just randomness. And we know there is uncertainty in the field of particles and all of that. So we know things are buzzing. They could be here. They could be there. They could move like this. This is uncertainty and in a sense chaos at the beginning, which is the lowest level of freedom. And as you grow in consciousness, then you start having potential for choice. 
So as we said, a cat will have less choice than a human being because mm -hmm. a human being has broader understanding, has broader consciousness, and therefore more ability to choose. So choice is all there on all strata, but it becomes <clears throat> just chaos in a sense or uncertainty on the level of um, of the unmanifest, or uh, not unmanifest, on the level of the uh, inception or start of, of the particles manifesting. Mm -hmm. Not to get our listeners. No, but this, this is really good because you're, you're saying a couple of things. Uh, when we think about this vast uh, consciousness, life itself, that's conscious of itself, you said it, ha it, it, it self reflects. So when I when I hear that, I always think about the fact that when when it is stated scripturally that we're made in the image and likeness of God, it means we have that same faculty, Beautiful. the consciousness, and we can self reflect. Right. And as we self reflect, we can actually um, manifest based on what we what we what we're reflecting within ourselves: love, peace, harmony, abundance, etc. So, a cat is the life of pure consciousness, but the cat may not have as much self-reflection as we have. Exactly, beautiful. It, well said. Yeah. So, so, and so, in that sense, and you talked about freedom. That this vast presence doesn't build in limitation. Freedom is intrinsic to us. I've always said over the years that this presence didn't build robots. You know, it recreated itself after its own life and its own image. So that freedom is built into, we have freedom. But as you've indicated, you know, we may have limited or expanded awareness. A limited awareness may produce some kind of experience. Expanded awareness may produce another kind of experience. But as we, and you, know, and you teach meditation, so as we, as we meditate and as we... Um, you know, begin to really work with our consciousness. There's a greater expansion, and then there's greater choice. I, I like what you're you're saying about so. So free will is net. You said free will is necessary, because we've been given freedom. Then there is a meaning to to manifestation. Then there is a meaning to existence. Yeah. Because if you say it's all uh, robotic, you use the right word. Right. That means everything is predetermined and determined, then there is no gaining in manifestation. Right. Nothing kind of is learned, nothing is experienced more. Now, having said this, there is also determinism. <laughs> there are laws. Right, which, right, right. For every action that you take freely, there is a reaction that is equal and opposite. And there is a reason for that. Why should that be like that? There is a very profound reason, which is to maintain the balance of uh, the reality overall. That also is a big topic, why there is action and reaction, why there is law, why there is determinism. And that is what makes sure that whatever you do, even if you do it in freedom, is going to have a specific result. So what is beautiful in this is that we can accommodate both determinism and freedom at the same time, which means mm -hmm. deterministic law, but freedom of choice. So you choose something like you take an apple seed, this is your choice and you put it in the field, but you cannot make the apple seed become a mango tree. It is There is a deterministic value. So every action we take has a consequences that will carry on. And these consequences put constraints on our future action. So mm -hmm. if you have done something in your life, uh, you might have done it in freedom, but it has consequences on your future life and what you are going to encounter in the future. Mm. This is what generally is used as the term of karma or the right. of one's action is always determined. And so today I might be determined by a number of things, but they are due to my actions in the past. So I take responsibility for what I am today and the constraints that 
I experience in my life today because these were my actions that I have done freely. So we can say the freedom of yesterday is determinism of today. <laughs> so there aren't any accidents in this universe. Right. right. Things happen by law and, and determinism based on energy that's been set in motion. Exactly. So this, this brings up a question. So you set something in motion in the past, but what happens if you expand your awareness and uh, you're not that same vibration anymore? Do you transcend what has been set in motion? What, what, what happens there? That's beautiful. You can counteract uh, your previous action. You yeah. know, if you did something wrong to your friend, you can now do something right and uh, correct the wrong. If you take money from the bank, uh, you are indebted. You can pay back your uh, to the bank, and now you don't have debt anymore. So there is a mechanism by which we can make the choices that will balance the previous action and allow us to go beyond the determinism and have a new freedom. You know, in the example of the seed and the apple tree, you put the seed and then you come to the tree and you have lots of apples at home. You don't want to eat apple. So you find, oh, you know, lo and behold, uh, I'm having apples again and it's my freedom. I decided <laughs> to plant an apple seed, but I want to eat mangoes. I don't want to eat apples today. So if your consciousness is narrow, you feel you're stuck because you have only apples. But if your consciousness is wide, you can say, well, I can take the apples to the market, sell the apples and buy mangoes. So right. now your apples have been transformed into mango because your consciousness is flexible and allows you to do this transaction. Right. This, this is happening on the surface level. Right. There is something deeper when you transcend, when you go beyond the surface of the ocean of the mind and go from the waves, dive into the self, there you can counteract actually the actions from a more basic level on the level of consciousness. Yeah. So even on the level of consciousness, you can create a counter effect to balance the previous actions that have happened because consciousness is all there is. And even what appears on the surface as physical and material is really a dynamics of consciousness. And those can be changed from consciousness. Yeah, I, I like that because you're talking about that which is on the surface. It's not any way even impacting the, the, the depth of the field of consciousness itself. Right, right. So, so this is why sometimes we'll read about individuals who have lived a very dastardly life and then had a spiritual insight and then totally changed. They totally had a great awareness that they were connected to this ineffable presence, whether they called it God or the power and the presence of love, beauty, intelligence. And then that which has been set in motion, they seem to have maybe gone so deep into the ocean of consciousness that they actually bypass the experience of what they've set in motion because they're not that person anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They transcend. You transcend. We purify ourselves. Right. That's why we use transcendental meditation. Transcending is to go beyond. So we go beyond the surface level of the ocean and dive deep within. <laughs> and we have seen people have their stresses removed, cleaned up, their health becomes better. This is simply also changing your constraints, which are due to previous action. So, you know, one has a negative thought, it's bothering them, but they transcend and they clean it up. Now they have a, a supportive thought, a nourishing feeling. And if you go to the ocean itself, then you experience the full potential of, of inner being and clean up and clear up all the stresses or the constraints, if you like to call them. I like this. What would be your perspective now on that which is called good and evil in this vast ocean of consciousness? How do you define that? Good is whatever allows us to grow in consciousness. Mm -hmm. and evil is what makes us uh, not grow in consciousness. I, I like that. It's because the opposite, because the, when you spell evil backwards, it's live. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if you're not growing, if you if if you're making a, a decision to be stuck or addicted to a particular thing, you're you're living backwards. You're that's evil. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So there's yeah. no like an evil force. And this is based on the nature of life, because we said the nature of life is to grow and expand, and the meaning of life is to gain bigger consciousness. Right. So the more your consciousness expands to start including, for example, others, mm. because if my consciousness knows that I am just not limited in my body, but I am also the expression of all that there is around me, and I include others in my awareness that they are part of me, <clears throat> that is how unity consciousness grows, the sense mm -hmm. of unity with everyone and with everything, even the environment. So whatever brings us uh, bigger awareness, closer to unity consciousness, to the sense of understanding that we are the ocean of consciousness and everything else also and everyone else is the ocean of consciousness, you're growing in that reality. Now, this can be translated into like the, uh, teachings, for example, do unto others what you'd like to be done unto yourself. So what this means is take the other like yourself. That means your consciousness grows from being limited in your small self to now include the other as part of yourself. That is why how we can explain that you know, all that is good then therefore is inclusive of others, of growth, of unity. All that is bad is what separates with the other, killing the other, stealing from the other, doing harm to the other is a way of dissecting and the, the diminishing the unity with the other. That's why evil is all that diminishes our perception of this unity. Right. So when we hear the statement, love your neighbor as yourself, we're, we're, we're defining the neighbor as any being, any being on any sentient being on the planet is our neighbor. And we love our neighbor as ourself, obviously with not egocentristic love, but a, a, a love of the, the divine that is within us. Now we've expanded our awareness to include everyone. Exactly. And, and um, interestingly enough, studies show that people that are depressed, if they open themselves up to serving someone else or taking their attention just off themselves, but on the other people, the depression seems to dissolve, starts to, they start to dissolve the depression because it's an expression now of how am I loving others? How am I serving others? And things of that particular nature. So there's some, there's some benefits to this, allowing others to be um, as important as we are to ourselves. Like I often tell when I do weddings, I'll tell the couple that you're committing to a person to the point where their happiness is as important to you as your own happiness. Beautiful. And so there's an expansion of 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 wanting, of unity. Yeah, this is this is good. Exactly. This is what love is. Love is to be able to take the other as much as possible, like one takes oneself. Yes, that is love. And maximum love is to see the other completely as oneself. That's unity consciousness, the consciousness which sees the other as myself. Right. And I often talk about the fact that when we look at what's going on in Lebanon right now, we look at what's going on in Gaza, we look at what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, or, or the Congo, you know, places that where there's wars, that the human consciousness has normalized war as a way of life you know it's like it's on the news and so people end up growing into this consciousness of that's the way it is and that's the way it's always going to be you know people come up as little kids and they watch the news and there's a war over here there's a war over there people are killing each other over there there's hate there's racism etc but it doesn't have to be that way what we're talking about here is that primordially we're all consciousness and I imagine you can talk a little bit about the effect of people meditating around the world and the effect that it has upon global consciousness, you know, so that we're no longer just normalizing war and war never determines who's right, it only determines who's left, you know. And so we're seeking to expand our awareness of this pure consciousness so that we're no longer normalizing hate 
and bigotry and war and who's right, you know. So what is your feeling on that? Absolutely. It's, again, the ocean of consciousness having different waves and uh, the waves are uh, limited perspective. If you are on a wave and you see only that much with, you know, uh, limited ability to see, you see only your wave and the other wave might seem like it's uh, going to splash on you or take away from your importance or from your ability to be a good wave, a strong wave, mm -hmm. because you're seeing only the wave. Now, if you dive within and experience that you are not just the wave, you are the ocean, then you realize that all the waves are yourself. Ah. And that happens on a very, very uh, simple level of awareness, not even intellectually. When you transcend and go deep within, you actually go deep within the ocean of consciousness. And naturally, you see yourself, you experience yourself as more expanded. And then you are one with, with everything. And you enliven, actually, as an individual, as a group and as a group, this feeling of unity within. And we have more than 116 scientific research studies that have been conducted on this field effect, what we call, of consciousness on peace and harmony in society. This was in the early 70s at the beginning. Maharishi said that if 1% of the people practice transcendental meditation, we should see a reduction in crime and conflict. And the scientists went out and actually checked the cities where there was 1% of the people meditating versus control cities where there was not this amount of people. And what they found is that in the cities that had 1% of the people meditating, there was decrease in crime, there was decrease in conflict. And so uh, as compared to the control cities where this didn't happen, and so we followed this up over the years, and now we have an advanced technique, which is called the cities, where you transcend and you float in that field of being in a special mm -hmm. And we have found that the square root of 1% is enough when people practice this program together to reduce crime, etc. And we followed this up for many, many years, uh, dozens of years, and have compared the number of people practicing this technique with uh, what is happening in society. And what was found is when the number is, uh, the critical number is reached, which is the square root of 1% of the population, there was a decrease in crime, decrease in hospital admission, decrease in infant mortality, dec decrease in accidents of the road, and many, many other factors uh, that have been studied and proven scientifically to be correct and have been published. So this direct experience of consciousness and expanding consciousness is not just for some little feeling of feeling good in the morning, feeling good in the evening, uh, because we practice transcendental meditation twice a day, morning and evening for 20 minutes. But it has an effect on one's well-being, one's creativity, one's intelligence and the removal of you know disease and health and wholeness and also on the wholeness and well-being of society as a whole so that even people who don't meditate they get the positive effect from the group that meditates and we propose this as a solution actually to conflict and war all it takes is just a few people practicing this program together and it can resolve the problems of conflict and war Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate the fact that there's a lot of science behind what you're saying. Control groups, non-control groups with uh, a 1% and a square root of 1% actually making a, a powerful effect on crime and violence and things of that particular nature. What's happening is since we're all one with each other on that ocean of devotion, we're affecting, everybody's affecting everybody. We're, we're, we're a, a hologram. We're a holographic expression of infinite consciousness. So what's happening within us, it's affecting all the waves. So we're not, people think they're powerless at times, that they can't do anything. You're making people become aware that, yeah, they're not powerless. If they actually tap into 
their infinite potential, come away from just the surface tension and go into the depth of the oceanic consciousness, they're making a difference in their neighborhood, in their city, their state. They're making a difference even in the world because there's no distance between anything and consciousness. The distance is only on the surface. Beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah, this is this is beautiful. Yeah, clever and wonderful. People often ask, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, that's a kind of a... Uh, I mean, I, I was asked that statement one time when I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, and it seems to be in the air a lot. Why, well, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, it is unfathomable. It's a field of of karma, <clears throat> where <clears throat> if you look at things from a more extended perspective, uh, rather than one lifetime, maybe we have many lifetimes. So we don't know what happened, what we have done in a previous lifetime. This is one way of explaining it. And therefore, there is a challenge that comes in this lifetime to resolve issues that have happened in a previous lifetime. So that's the principle of karma, not within only one lifetime, but throughout existence. That's one one factor. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, bad things happen as a challenge <clears throat> And they can be an opportunity to grow and an opportunity to overcome a situation. So if one takes it from that perspective, then even challenges can be opportunities and can be transformed in a spiritual growth and the ability to see more than what we've seen before. So one can feel like I'm a good person, etc. But maybe they have some something to work on in their life to allow them to actually expand their awareness and grow. And sometimes these things happen that appear to be bad, but they have some quality in them that can be very helpful for the growth and development. Absolutely. I've said in the past that um, if, you, if you have a vision or you're pulled by a great mm, goal for your life, that a challenge may come that actually activates the latent potential within you that allows you to be the person to achieve that goal or to uh, complete that vision. So I'm, I'm, I resonate exactly with what you're saying. And I would also add um, what I, I call it the Job effect, where Job supposedly says, um, what I feared most came upon me, that oftentimes people have hidden fears. Yes. That they generate that energy of what they're afraid of and then they manifest it not based on what they want but based on what they're fearing you know yes yes yeah so i appreciate this now this this book consciousness is all there is this has just been released right right yeah so we've talked about some of the tenets but what are the tenets of this book would you like to leave the audience with what are some of the nuances consciousness is all that's a big title consciousness is all that there is <laughs> which is true <laughs> well uh, for for all those who are looking for answers to questions that seem to be difficult to answer like the meaning of life uh, why we are here, what is good, what is evil, choice and determinism, some of the topics that Reverend has raised and that we discussed briefly. And, you know, what is goodness, what is uh, relation to others, why, why we should do what to develop our true meaning of life, what it means to live a well-lived life, how to flourish in life. Uh, this book, presents all of these questions in a unified way on a very simple understanding and principle that there is an ocean of consciousness and that ocean manifests as many different waves. Why does it manifest? How the, to deal with it? How to reach the maximum potential of our life? These are the kind of questions and answers that are given in the book. So I hope we can understand and look deeper into this paradigm of reality because if we want to solve the problems of war and crime and difficulties in society there is a way to do it there is a technology of consciousness which is based on an understanding of consciousness as primary 
And so it has many practical uh, directions and guidance of what to do and how to understand one's life uh, and living and put it in a greater context, in a bigger context. That's beautiful. Consciousness is all there is, Dr. Nader. One last thing, I was reading, you've done a lot of major presentations, like Stanford, Harvard Business School, titled Hacking Consciousness. Hacking Consciousness. I mean, people are hacking health these days. They're hacking their diet, their nutrition. You know, you're saying hacking consciousness. What's the nuance around that? See, all that we do, and we have these different values. We have exercise, we have nutrition, we have all of these values that has have developed and grown, and they are important. Um, but we have forget that all that we do is mm. in consciousness. So whatever you do is to feel better. What does it mean to feel better? It means your consciousness has a color of feeling good. Uh, your awareness, because again, without your awareness, there is nothing, you know, in deep anesthesia, for example, one can be undergoing surgery and you don't feel anything, you don't experience anything, there is no meaning to anything. So all that we do is ultimately to be good, to feel good, to feel well, and to feel that others are well, maybe our society is well, but all of this is experience on the screen of consciousness, on the reality of awareness. And we have assumed that this awareness is uh, granted and uh, is just something we have. We don't know that we can develop it and that actually its development is mm -hmm. foundational in our life and it, it's foundational in terms of meaning of life, in terms of ability to be having more freedom, ability to be more happy and grow. And so this, uh, this book and this focus is on how to develop consciousness and the importance of that as a primary aspect because all the different rivers actually go into the ocean and uh, that ocean or that lake, and we want it to be an infinite ocean, is the ocean of consciousness. Absolutely. I, it's interesting because I, I wrote in my um, my note diary this morning on my phone, I woke up and I wrote down, we have to develop our consciousness of joy and peace and love and abundance uh, prior to being happy based on an external condition. You know, so this is what you're talking about. We have to develop our consciousness. Consciousness is primary. Right, right. Yeah. And, and it this... can be developed. It's not just either I'm awake or not. Right. It's either I'm clear, I'm peaceful, I am happy, I am broad comprehension, I see for the long term, I see for the wide perspective. These are different levels of consciousness. Rather than being drowsy or dull, or clouded awareness, you can't experience anything, you feel low, you can expand your awareness and see that you are the ocean of being and live fullness of life. Absolutely. And, and we want people to know that this is not highfalutin. You know, it's not way out there. Just simple practices and intentions every day can begin to expand your awareness so that you become aware that you're significant in this ocean of consciousness. And oftentimes people, they want to put it off. They think they have to be someone special or do something big. But sitting down every day and, and meditating is extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly that draw of draw on the infinite reservoir of creativity and intelligence, which is within us in the same way as a tree sends its roots down in the field to pick up the nutrients and then it can grow out on the outside so the desire to be powerful on the outside to be strong and to be achieving and to be feeling good even on the outside depends on how deep are your roots in the inside and you know if the roots are very slim the wind will kind of break the tree and you cannot create big waves on a little pond or a little glass of water you need the ocean and the bigger the ocean, the bigger mm. the wave on the outside. So 
go within, be the ocean, and create the biggest possible waves of happiness and joy on the outside. Absolutely. This is great. Is there anything emerging that you want to say before we go that you may have said to yourself, oh, I should have mentioned that before I, before we signed off, and let people know how they can find you and be in touch with you? Everyone is a field of all possibilities because that's the nature of life. And if you go to the ocean of being rather than being just a wave, go to the ocean, be the ocean, and all your dreams can be fulfilled. Uh, you can live a life of fullness and happiness and joy. This is the true nature of life and actually the birthright of everyone because once we are born, we are an expression of that ocean. All we need to know is know that we are that ocean and use that power and intelligence that is within the ocean. Uh, I have a website. It's called drtonynader.com. Uh, we have a program for transcendental meditation. It's on tm.org. Uh, we are also now having a program which is called Meditate America, which we launched with the David Lynch Foundation. I encourage everyone to go to David Lynch or check David Lynch Foundation in, um, in your whatever search engine, and uh, you will find the programs and the teachers that can teach transcendental meditation in your locality. And we have a special program going on now to create that awakening and fullness on the individual level and for society. And this program has been used with all veterans, firefighters, you know, different hospitals, uh, Heal the Healers program that we have, uh, where doctors and nurses and hospital employees who have been through Difficult times during COVID, for example, are now using it. We have we are in many, many hospitals uh, and it's expanding uh, everywhere. So the join in for your personal well-being and radiate happiness and peace in society. Absolutely. Dr. Tony Nader, thank you so much for being with us today and adding so much value to this podcast, Take Back Your Mind. Absolutely appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Reverend Beckwith. You are an amazing radiance of knowledge and harmony and inspiration. God bless you. Thank you for looking at yourself <laughs> and, brought, and projecting it onto me. I receive it. <laughs> Peace and blessings, everyone. Peace and blessings. We come to the portion of Take Back Your Mind where we actually practice meditation, which is fundamental, the foundational piece for transformation, foundational piece for expanding our awareness to tap into the undifferentiated consciousness that is everywhere, of which is our very life and being. Meditation is transportation to transformation. Trans means to go beyond. Transformation means you're going beyond the present formation of your life, constantly growing and evolving into your greater yet to be glory after glory. That's our purpose, to keep expanding and keep reflecting the infinite according to our uniqueness, which is our superpower. So let's turn within for a moment. Have your feet firmly placed on the ground unless you're in a full lotus position. Let's tense up everything. First, let's unrelax the body. Squeeze your hands, the bottom of your feet, your face, your scalp, your shoulders to your ears. Squeeze everything and release. Close the eyes. Establish the vibrational intention. Our intention is to expand our awareness. Our intention is to wake up to our glorious oceanic nature. That's our intention. Now, in riding on the wave of that intention, we turn within. And since we've been talking to Dr. Tony Nader, let's put our attention on a mantra. 
the mantra today is I am. So just feel I am. And just say that to yourself until you are listening to it without saying it. I am. Listen to the reverberation of I am. The mind drifts, come back to your intention and listen to yourself saying, I am. I am. And it is from this awareness, this expanded awareness of our true nature and our true being, that we enter into a field of gratitude and thanksgiving for no reason whatsoever, just to be grateful. In this consciousness of gratitude, we become so receptive to the mighty blessings of the Spirit of the Living One. There's nothing in us denying more good from flooding our life. Good that is beyond our wildest imaginings. We give thanks for this. Our day, our afternoon, our evening, and our night is now blessed with this intention of waking up to our glorious nature. And it's all happening now, right now. This is why we can say, and so it is, now and forever. Amen. Ashe. Peace and blessings, everyone. Remember, don't leave home without it. Always have a moment of turning within and connecting with pure spirit within your very soul before you go out into your day. It'll make a magnificent big difference. Blessings.
Peace and blessings. I truly hope that you are enjoying Take Back Your Mind podcast. The Take Back Your Mind podcast is sponsored primarily by the Agape International Spiritual Center. In other words, everything that you see in terms of the staff that puts this together, the editing, the equipment, all of this is sponsored by our Agape International Spiritual Center. So if you are enjoying the podcast, I'm inviting you to support the sponsor. Support Agape. Simply go to agapelive.com and make a donation. And say in the donation that you are supporting the podcast. It allows us to keep broadcasting. It allows us to keep putting these magnificent moments together with these wonderful people that I get to interview. We keep having the possibility of updating the equipment that's necessary and providing the wonderful content that many of you are writing in and saying, I really love the podcast. Support the podcast. Support the sponsor. Agape International Spiritual Center. AgapeLive.com. You can also text to donate. You can text the word GIVE to 424 421-6243 and put podcast so that we know that you're really supporting this wonderful podcast. Our secondary sponsor is Adapt-A-Zen. A-D-A-P-T-O-Z-E-N. This is my superfood greens. It's nutritionally dense because I teach spirit, mind, and body. We want our body temples to be healthy. So one of the products is my superfood greens. You can go to NutraRise.com. Those three little lines you see, you hit those three little lines and you'll see Adaptazen. There's two products, my superfood greens and a product called Elevate, which are organic mushrooms for your health. You can put both in your smoothies so that you have main ingredients for the health of your body temple. These are our sponsors. Primary sponsor, Agape International Spiritual Center. Secondary sponsor, Adaptazen. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be wise. Circulate and share. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable. So I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind, and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.